Okay, this evening's lecture with Chris uh, is an annual event, and it's uh, the high point of uh, the year for Radical Anthropology Group. For those of you who are new to all this, Chris is a revolutionary. Uh, I'm talking about scientific revolution. Sometimes these things happen. And uh, Chris um, changed the way we think about human origins in a very dramatic way. So just, just for those of you who don't know, there was a time when it was imagined that us, modern humans around the planet, all evolved rather gradually over maybe a million or more years in Africa, uh, Europe, and Asia. Um, and that would have meant, of course, that across the planet we would have all been racially very different. It would have been racial differences would have been deep. Okay? And what Chris did, and it seemed at the time, I remember in the 80s, it seemed a bit wild, <laughs> uh, possibly even unlikely, what Chris did was completely uh, overthrow the apple chart and, and, uh, and, and suggest that, in fact, we're all very recent um, immigrants, all of us, we're all kind of Africans in a relatively recent sense. Um, which would mean, of course, that we're all much more closely related to each other than was previously imagined. And that was the origin of the idea which came to be known as the human revolution, a relatively rapid emergence of our, uh, our modernity, our behavioral and cognitive uh, modernity. Um, in the years since Chris launched that revolution and succeeded in winning it, this revolution has become quite a bit more gradual. It's gone back into the past a lot. Uh, and we now know a lot more and we know that the revolution, if there was a revolution, certainly this rapid change happened in Africa. And, and, it, and we now know that everything really happened in Africa. It wasn't just anatomical modernity, we had to wait until we got to Europe before we became clever. Everything that made us human happened in Africa. So it's quite extraordinary that, uh, that, some, that uh, I think one man, obviously, lots of people did it, but there's no doubt about it that Chris was absolutely the pioneer. And uh, the things he wrote about and, and discovered in the, in the 80s, they're still part of the same paradigm, really, although it's been modified and lost, I think it's going to be more complex and possibly more pluralist. The paradigm which, which Chris established in that early period is the paradigm everyone now um, accepts, possibly one or two um, exceptions, but I would say fundamentally we have a revolution eventually becoming the consensus, which is always nice. So uh, over, over, to, um, over to Chris. Nothing to live up to there. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yes, current controversies, well, there are plenty of those, of course, and at the end, maybe we can come back to the more general controversies, but I thought I'd just look at three things which have been in the news you know, recently. Um, one is going back, I mean, not very current, really, but on a hundred, a hundred years on the Pleistocene time scale, Built Down Man. Uh, we published some research this year about Built Down Man, and uh, we think it's throwing you know, some, some real light on, on who was behind at least a lot of it. Obviously, Conrad Jurisiensis, there have been publications in the last year about that, so we'll talk about that. And of course, Homo Naledi, so I'm going to talk about those three, and then we can come back to all the other big issues later on. So, is it worth doing the last bit, or are we okay to wait? Yes, so first of all, then, Homo floresiensis. So this was the cover of Nature in 2004, short of age. Third Asian Homo species reveals diversity of Pleistocene humanity. And, and this was a pretty revolutionary time uh, at the time. Uh, some people actually didn't believe it. There are still a few people who still don't believe this is a distinct uh, human species. So it has raised a lot of issues, so go back. <coughs> because it got published at the time the Hobbit films were, were out, uh, inevitably this was a small body of human, uh, it got nicknamed the Hobbit and that name was stuck. So uh, here we've got a little bit from Lord of the Rings. To begin with Hobbit size, far back in the old days, but are now lost and forgotten. And the world being after all full of strange creatures being found, these little people seemed of very little importance, but they suddenly became by no wish of their own, both important and renowned. Trouble the councils of the wise and the right. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's true. And, uh, and uh, troubled them very much. So, we can kind of forget the last 12 years and, and go back to, to how it was in 2004 before that material was published. So, 
the main idea was pre-human osteocytosis died out more than one million years ago, and they only lived in Africa. Their brains were too small for what we could call human behavior, even including shared complex tool-makers. Early Homo erectus dispersed from Africa about 1.8 million years ago, and only got as far as Java, so this species did not have boats. Continued evolving, for example, getting a larger brain, possibly survived, <coughs> in Java until about 50,000 years ago. We certainly we're not sure about that date. Modern humans evolved in Africa around 200,000 years ago, began to spread globally about 60,000 years ago, they reached Australia by about 50,000 years ago, and they were able to do that because they had boats. Um, the last archaic humans were the Neanderthal, they died out about 39,000 years ago, depends on who ask on that date. So just to make that point with a map as well, so early humans getting as far as uh, the Wallace line. So this is of course a, uh, an artificial biogeographic line uh, named after Wallace. And the idea is that between the huge land masses of Australasia and Southeast Asia, um, Sunda and Sahu, you've got this body of islands which were largely isolated. They were never connected to either region in any major way, um, and therefore they were isolated. They have a very, very impoverished faunas of mammals and birds and so on. Um, and it was thought that only modern humans using boats were able to cross Wallace's line and eventually island hop into New Guinea and Australia. And there's a debate about whether those ancestors of modern Australasians went through a, a, an eastern route into New Guinea first, or could they have gone down this route and headed eastwards along this chain of islands into Australia. Maybe they could have done both. So the point was only modern humans got really past that Wallace line. And we had Homo erectus, as we mentioned, known in Java, uh, going back more than a million years. So looking at that uh, chain of islands uh, in, in the southwest of that chain, so here we've got Java with Homo erectus fossil on it, Ali, Lombok, Sumbawa, and Nyambua, which is the site I'm going to talk about on the Isle of Flores. So here's the Isle of Flores, the Solar Basin, I'll mention that as well. Um, and there's Wallace's line indicated there. So there's deep water between this group of islands and the rest of Southeast Asia. So Mike Morwood and colleagues decided to excavate on Flores and what they did was that they reopened old trenches that um, the Dutch had opened. There was a Dutch priest who did work on the island, and he got into possibly Pleistocene deposits in some of these sites. And so Morgan decided to enlarge the trenches and take them deeper. And what he was looking for was the evidence of those first modern humans coming through the region, maybe 40, 50, thousand years ago. So that was his expectation that somewhere there would be archaeological and maybe even the largely fossil evidence of modern humans in the deeper levels of these trenches. So they sank, as you can see, some very deep trenches. Um, yeah, I'll for sake here, yeah. because they propped it up pretty well, but they, uh, you know, these, these are very deep trenches. And one of the problems, the cause problem later, was that these trenches, of course, some of them, as they went down, they actually got smaller. The walls for safety were, were angled, so actually they were ending up with really quite a small area at the bottom of the trench compared with the top. And this had problems of correlation and dating, which we'll, we'll come back to. This is Liangbu, a cool, cool cave. Cool, cool. Liangbu, that's what it means. And it's a huge cave. And here are places where they were excavated. Um, and we working with an international team with Indonesians as well. Here he is, sadly died a couple of years ago. Um, but he was really the, the person who led this work so much of the time. So, um, in 2003, what was the technical on here? Um, at the bottom of one of these trenches, the budget board, and they came across uh, a skeleton, and uh, a skull was there. And it was obviously a small bodied human, and they assumed it was the skull of a child because it was very small. Um, but when they looked closely at it, they saw that the, uh, the third molars were fully erupted, the wisdom teeth were up, so this was not uh, a child. It apparently was an adult, uh, and yet it was really small. So the paleoanthropologist on the uh, 
expedition was Peter Brown. He wasn't there at the time this was found, but he was sent photos, and obviously he then got a good look at the material, and you know, he was greatly puzzled by it because they were expecting to find all the humans, and here was something which obviously was tiny, tiny brain, apparently in recent sediments, as far as they could judge, maybe the last 20, 30, 40,000 years. So where they were expecting to find more humans, there was this tiny human with a small brain. So um, Peter Brown actually sent me um, some pictures. He didn't say where he got this from, but he sent me this picture um, at the end of 2003. And he said, what do you think this is? <laughs> and the right here. And I knew Peter had been working in China. So I said to him, um, well, uh, have you found a homo habilis in China? And that would be sensational. And he said, no, no, no not China, no, not, not homo habilis. So I said, well, you know, what is it? It looks very weird. It's got a brow ridge of some kind. It, you know, it looks got a modern looking face, but uh, otherwise uh, it's a very strange um, creature. Um, so then he sent me another picture with the mandible this time. Uh, you know, it obviously, it didn't have a chin on the mandible. Um, so I, I kept pestering about what it was, and he said, well, actually, it's from, you know, closer to Australia. So I said, Java, you found, uh, you found the, yeah, the most primitive erectus, or maybe I'm going to have this on Java. And he said, well, you're getting close, you're getting warm. <laughs> um, he said, but it's only 20,000 years old. <laughs> it wasn't April the first, <laughs> but yes, indeed. You know, and then obviously I got to see some of the publications they put together, and they they were incredibly brave. Really, you know, I mean, Brown and his was incredible credit for, for just taking that leap of imagination to interpret this thing. Thought it was a, a very strange, distinct human. Probably whether it's a human species or not, but certainly not a non-human at all. Um, something quite distinct with a, with a quite distinct evolutionary history. And they debated what to call it. So I think at one stage it was going to be called Sundanthropus, you know, the Sunda area, Sunda man, Sundanthropus floresiensis. Um, but when it got refereed uh, in nature, the reviewers, some of them certainly took the view that this was in some way related to erectus because the CT scan showed the walls and skull quite thick. Um, the cranial base was reasonably well flexed, so even though it had a small brain, some of the reviewers said this is a homo, uh, it's an early homo, and, and you should recognise it as genus homo. So they did, they ended up calling it homo floresiensis. Um, so that was the publication, and the dating. So here, right down, notice this is deep down in that trench, here's where the skeleton was found, and they did have some dating problems because the radiocarbon dates based on charcoal did suggest really quite a young age. Maybe you know, maybe 15,000, but certainly 17,000 years old. There were clearly stone tools uh, around the level of the skeleton and other parts. They had, so this creature was stone tool making. There were remains of a dwarf uh, elephant-like creature called Stegodon um, in, the, in the deposits as well. Um, but there were luminescence dates that actually gave older ranges. Some of them gave 30, 20,000 years, not too far away. So in the publication, they preferred the radio harm dates, which they thought would be, would be more accurate. So it was a sensation. You know. <laughs> um, and uh, so on the one hand, once the Hobbit man got around, the talking state threatened to sue anyone who used the Hobbit man to mention at this point without their authorization, so, but it didn't make a difference, everyone did. <laughs> <laughs> and here's this reconstruction, because also in the cave were remains of a giant rat that lived there, so the idea is that here's the, here's the hobbit um, you know, feeding off, of, off of giant rats. Uh, and here's a, a cartoon by Brooks, so of course this is the time of uh, the, the bush uh, Blair Alliance, and so here we've got T Tony Blair. <laughs> Nasty Hobbits, Homo Britannicus. So you see, that's, that's the name of my book on early humans. Uh, Bushman bones have been discovered. Scientists revealed this week, shedding new light on the history of humankind, evolving in dwarf form because of his isolated island habitat. The Hobbits were three, three inches short and had a brain the size of a walnut, but not quite as tasty. And here we have the Blair smug teeth as unearthed. <laughs> <laughs> Smiling teeth. Uh, they sat out the same giant rat on his shoulders. 
So then, okay, so it, it was, you know, it was a huge story and, you know, huge controversy. A lot of scientists immediately said, no, this, this can't be true. There can't be something uh, with a brain size so small, so tiny bodied, so critical for people on the island of Florence, on the bottom line, 20,000 years old. It is frankly impossible. So they just really to believe it. Um, and it is tiny, so here we've got two jaw bones. Um, this is the one on the skull, so this is the one here. So this is a stereolithograph. So this is from a CT scan, so it gives you a pretty good picture of what it looks like. You can see how tiny that jawbone is. Uh, that's this one here. And this is the second jawbone, uh, <coughs> uh, Leandro 6, which I'll come back to later. But you can see straight away, we can compare the jawbone with the human jawbone, and we can compare the skull with a modern human skull. And you can see how tiny that is. So, incredible material. And so the idea grew up and partly based on the reviewers' comments to nature, that, that this was the view that they took, that this was probably an island form of Homo erectus, that Homo erectus had somehow got from Java to the island of Flores, and this species had undergone island dwarfing. And this is a well-known phenomenon in large mammals. If they get onto islands which have restricted resources, evolution drives them in a direction where they will use less resources, they will become smaller body, they will use less resources. So it's happened many times. So here's an example of elephant dwarfism on, on the islands in the Mediterranean. Incredible. You know, this is the ancestral elephant, and that's what it ends up with, the island dwarf. And here is the Liangu one skeleton with a long human. So it's about the height of a three-year-old child, uh, average uh, and yet fully adult. So the idea is that Homo erectus then dwarfs down to the size of the Liangu material. And the brain is indeed very small, 417, I mean, various sun estimates put it up to 425, but this is, you know, an absolute ape sized brain, you know, chimp, or small gorilla size. So here's a plot of brain size, modern human values, the adults will be up there too, Homo erectus. So here is a uh, with body size estimate, brain size estimate, here is the Liangu individual down with chips and Australia's Afrikaans in terms of the uh, brain and, and body size ratio. And some people actually decided that it was so primitive that it might not even be genus homo. So Peter Brown himself noted that the pelvic remains had many resemblances to those of Australopithecus, including the Lucy uh, pelvis. And here's some work by Debbie Arkin, where she did an analysis of the cranial shape, and the Pharisiensis skull came out as an outcome to all humans. It was more primitive than Homo habilis um, in terms of its relationships, and more primitive than real offenses. So some people said, well, maybe it's Nostropithecus. It's actually, should be called Nostropithecus Pharisiensis. <coughs> and then we get all the Hobbit deniers um, and there are quite a few of them to begin with. There's a few less now, but there's still a few. So a lot of people just absolutely <coughs> believe it, it was an ancient uh, separate species. They argued that it was in some way diseased in modern human. So I think uh, Bill Junk has called it um, you know, uh, pathology of the month, was what he called it. Each month would be a new paper saying it was some new pathology. So pituitary growth hormone, the wrong syndrome, Down syndrome was suggested. Um, we've got uh, cretinism, uh, so iodine deficiency. So these were all suggested explanations for uh, its tiny size. Um, yes, uh, so here we are. Uh, its tiny cranial capacity cannot result from normal dwarfing. Consideration of more appropriate microcephalic syndrome and specimens support the idea of modern human microcephaly. And, uh, and Kate Watton should have known better, but she was influenced by, it, interestingly, it was mainly multi regionalist so Chris alluded to this view that was around that, that you know, in the last one and a half to two million years there's essentially only been one species of human on earth um, which evolved into modern humans in these different parts of the world so Neanderthals evolved into us in Europe uh, and Homo erectus in China evolved into modern Oriental people Homo erectus in Java evolved into modern Australian people and Homo erectus in Africa evolved into modern Africa so that was a view that was around and these multi-regionists in particular couldn't get to grips with the idea that there could be something so distinct 20,000 years ago. So they said it can't be, it must be diseased, it must be uh, a mistake. 
Um, you know, Kate Wong said uh, she even published a view by one of these deniers who argued that the uh, that the jawbone actually had signs of a tooth filling in it. Uh, so this was really within the last 100 years, which is only 100 years old, and that it had actually been. I mean, they only said it in interviews, but they argued that it had actually been planted uh, right through there in the pit. Was actually a, a pathological recent human that someone had planted to cook up this wonderful story uh, of an ancient human species. And this is, in fact, uh, one of the books that makes these claims. Uh, Henneberg, Eckhart, and Schofield, The Hobbit Trap, How New Species Are Invented, second edition. Um, and I thought you could ask, you know, gave it a glowing reference that he was by then in his 80s, so you've got to make that. But, you know, this is just awful. It, it more or less accuses Morgan and his team of fooling you, of fooling you, basically, especially in, in the site, uh, of making the whole thing up. So it's just mm -hmm. not but in fact, there are a lot of, it isn't just one skeleton. You know, I've already talked about the second jawbone. Um, there are over 100 fossils now from the site assignable to Homo floresiensis. Um, there are two sets of wrist bones, and there's an interesting story there that the wrist bones um, were replicated by my colleague Lorraine Cornish at the museum. So she went out to Flores to advise them on conservation on, on how to preserve the material. And I'll come on to why later. But, um, she actually replicated a number of the specimens. She was going back through America, she called it at the Smithsonian, and while she was there, she said, well, I've got some public replicas there, you're going to want to see them. People there haven't seen any of the material. Um, and the guy called Matt Tukeri was there, um, and uh, you know, he, you know, she showed him the, uh, the wrist bones of the public skeleton, and he said, you've got this mistake, but it's concrete from that creature. These look like the wrist bones of Australopithecus afarensis, which you had seen. They can't read from the sketch. She said, look, oh, they just replicated. They are. And sure enough, it turned out that those wrist bones are unlike any recent view. It was only avatar or antiquated uh, sigma material. They show very primitive features and they're replicated in a second set of wrist bones from a different part of the sequence. So, all of, you know, there are a number of long bones here, and the incredible thing is that the long bones in the skeleton are actually the largest long bones. So adult leg and arm bones, and they're actually smaller, even though they're bit of the adult than the ones in the outer skeleton. So that's not an exceptionally small individual. A number of these others were equally or even smaller than the hobbit skeleton. Anyway, so yeah, things took a long time. At the end of 2004, this guy, Teku Yafo, now he, um, kind of national hero in Indonesia, so he was involved in the, uh, the liberation of the country to the Dutch. Uh, he's a paleoanthropologist. He had made many discoveries of Homo erectus, but by now he was around 90. And he was uh, very diffed. He was very upset that he hadn't been involved in this discovery, in this announcement. And he became convinced that it was a dwarf modern human and not anything distinct. So he actually knew some of the people in the institute where these boats were being stored. So he got a big hold of them and he went there one weekend and persuaded these people they had been, and he just loaded a number of these fossils into his bag and walked off with them. He just hijacked them. And he, he held on to them for many months, held on for six months, that's a huge glory. So Morgan and his team and other Indonesian people, you know, raised a protest. There were letters in nature, there were international uh, arguments going back and forwards about this disgraceful behavior. Eventually, six months later, he was forced to return them, but unfortunately, the most awful part of the story. He, the stuff hadn't been conserved because you know, more didn't seem a lot of stuff, they were still stuck in the um, They hadn't conserved the material in any way, thinking they would be replicated by a CT scan something. But they hadn't dared to replicate it because the stuff was really soft and friable. And unfortunately, before he sent these bits back, uh, Teku Yaka ordered his technicians to make castle. So they put silicon rubber around these delicate specimens without conserving them, and of course they were irreparably damaged. Um, and this is this is a shocking story. So here we've got examples. So here's the jawbone as it was. Uh, this is how it came back. So it's lost pieces off it. Um, it's actually got a plaster chin here because that jawbone. I'll show you another view of it. Um, and obviously broken. You're trying to get it out of the moulds. The material broken. It, here's the pelvis that was never properly published, that was never CT scanned. That's how it came back after being hijacked. Um, here we've got the jawbone again with a lot of damage to it. 
and, and worst of all, so here's a, an incredible view. So this is the same jawbone as it was. This is the Leander VI manual. This is how it came back after this ridiculous, look at the shape of it, it's unbelievable. So the thing that broke, and this is all plaster that's been put in there, um, so it's astonishing, you know, it bears no resemblance. And the sad thing was this wasn't CT scanned because Brown hadn't yet got a chance to study it. So irreparable damage was done to that material, and that's why I call it Lorraine Cornish when the stuff came back. She was called out there to try and make as good as possible the damage that had been done to the material. So that's disgraceful. <coughs> Well, that's been denied. Uh, the Yakov, of course, said that they caused the damage themselves in order to discredit him. Um, okay, so in the last year, though, we've had exciting developments that helped to reinforce this story of, of a separate lineage on Flores. So I didn't mention yet that there are stone tools at sites on Flores that date back 700,000 years and even a million years in open sites in Flores uh, in the Southern Basin. And in one of those sites, dating at 700,000, they found parts of a jawbone and small human teeth. And these teeth are as small as the ones in the Hobbit ones. In fact, some of them are even smaller. So here we have evidence of a small human at 700,000 years. So this lineage, this, this population was already there and had either arrived small-bodied or it was dwarfed down by 700,000 years ago. And you then get apparently a continuity of occupation there. So the suggestion is, given that the tools go back a million years, that this is a residence of at least a million years of this lineage on the island of Florence. And then the dating was revised. So I mentioned these very narrow trenches that they were forced to excavate because obviously they started in wide trenches, and then as they went deeper and deeper, they, they obviously uh, angled in the walls. So they had small areas. So where the skeleton came out, it really was a small area. Um, and they did their best with the dating, but they never really had wide sequences. And I mentioned this mismatch between the charcoal dating, the radiocarbon dating, and the luminescence dating. Well, it turned out once they went back and did wider work and actually widened the trenches, they found that there was an unconformity. So basically, here's the LV1 skeleton, that's where the OB6 jawbone came from. They were lying in sediments that were actually representing an ancient block of sediment against the wall of the cave. And then much younger sediment had banked against it. And so in the same trench, you went from stuff that was 50 or 60,000 years old to stuff that was 20,000 or less years old. And they hadn't recognized that in those small trenches. So they did direct dating on the material, and they dated it. And the dating now then uh, suggests that that skeleton is about 60,000 years old. So here's the sort of sequence on Flores now that we can put together with the sites with archaeology and the different faunas. Um, and so the oldest tools are down to about a million years. We've got human teeth and the jawbone at around 700,000. The Homo flores is a skeleton at around 60,000 years. And now, just mentioned at the Escher conference in a brief uh, presentation there, they have some teeth which appear to be modern human teeth above of it in the, in the Leambo sequence dated at around 47,000 years old. So that's really quite nice because it means that you have got, as more predicted, modern humans in the site, and then not far below, you seem to have the Hobbit skeleton in this particular tree. And so we have this possibility. Did, did Hobbits interact with modern humans around 50,000 years ago? And this is a real possibility now. So just as we had modern humans and Neanderthals interacting in Europe and Asia between 40 and 60,000 years ago, you know, did modern humans interact with it? Did they, were they involved in the extinction of Homo floresiensis, directly or indirectly? Um, was there even hybridization? Who knows? Who knows? So yeah, um, a lot more to learn about exactly when it disappeared. Uh, I should say the archaeology associated with the Hobbit appears to go on to about 50,000 years in the cave, and then we get the appearance of one humans. So how did the Hobbit get there? At least, it seems, a million years ago, its ancestors were on the island of the Flores. Well, most people, of course, who thought of erectus, thought, well, it's got to have come in this direction. But the point is, let's go on to the next slide. Um, there's a thing called the Indonesian through flow, and this is the main direction of currents in this region. Uh, through Wallacea. And 
you can see that the main currents are actually going north-south, and they're actually going in the opposite direction. So if you're trying to go from Java in some way, even on boats or rafts or whatever, the, the currents are actually against you. So Moore would argue on this basis, and there's evidence that this, this was happening in the Pleistocene too, this is a, a long-term um, situation of water flow through these islands. He argued that the most likely place to look for the ancestors of the Hobbit will be on a place like Sulawesi, where you will get movement from the north rather than Java from the west. And of course, he and his team uncovered evidence of artifacts on Sulawesi at the moment only going back 150,000 years, but I'm sure there must be more than there. Um, so sorry, let's just go back to that previous one. So yeah, um, what about boats? Well, yeah, we can't deny the possibility that uh, you know, there could have been could have been boats that uh, took the Hobbit's ancestors far south. But it's a lot to ask if a million-year-old Homo erectus or, or something even more primitive. Um, so the possibility, of course, alternatively, is, is natural rafting, and it may seem extraordinary because this is tectonically a really active area. You know, lots of volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis. So in that, in that tsunami of six years ago, people were found on rafts of vegetation out at sea, 150 kilometers out at sea, after a week, still alive on these rafts of vegetation. And when you've got tens or hundreds of thousands of years to play with, it's certainly possible that you know, there were some proto-hobbits uh, feeding in a mangrove swamp, and a tidal wave just came and ripped that mangrove swamp away with them in it, and they survived long enough to arrive, perhaps initially, on one of the other islands. This may have been not a direct transfer onto Florence, it might have actually <coughs> been a transfer through successive stages. And of course the possibility is that the dwarfing process had actually happened somewhere else already by a million years ago, if it was a dwarfing process, and then an already dwarf species ended up on Florence. We really don't know the size. We know that 700,000 years ago, these individuals were small, but we don't know whether they draw from Florence or whether they were already small bodied. And some people who look at the earliest Homo erectus material, for example, in Dominici, there you've got a much smaller bodied Homo erectus that's quite a small brain Homo erectus. And many of us think that that's a better model for the ancestor of the body than if you go for a large body erectus such as the ones on Java billion years ago, it's actually easier to start with a small erectus at 1.8 billion, like the Dominici ones. You've then not got to dwarf down as much, nor dwarf the brain size down much to get to. So we really don't know if it's whole evolutionary history. So yeah, here are some of the different hypotheses. So this was a, a commentary I wrote a couple of years ago in Nature for the, for the 10th anniversary. So that's worth a look. It's got those different ideas summarised. So I did. I was asked by Nature to put this hypothesis in because there was still at least one scientist who believed in it. Go in there, but it's a wolf from a sapient. Um, but I'm kind of torn between the idea that it is a an early erectus that's walked down, or or could it even be evidence of something more primitive getting out of Africa before the erectus? So yeah, what does it all mean for human evolution? If the Hobbit is a dwarf erectus, it shows that early humans spread further than we knew and were subject to extreme island dwarfing, including the brain. If the Hobbits are more primitive survival from something at least two million years old, then we're missing its whole early history in Asia. Either way, it apparently shows us that human behavior can be associated with an ape-sized brain, because certainly the tools uh, on, on the floor is associated with the skeleton arm are certainly reasonably complex tools. They're not quite like the human tools, but they're, you know, they're not the simplest, older of them kind of uh, tools. Its survival into the recent geological past on a remote island suggests there may be many more surprises to come. And I think that's absolutely right, but when we look at this diagram, you know, we can see all these other islands here. So if that had happened down here, why couldn't it have happened as well on a lot of these other islands? They could all have their own little kind of hobbit experiment going on over a million year period. So fantastic sort of amount of data still to come from that area. Okay, now to something different. Uh, Piltdown Mountain. So this is I've worked in the country for over 40 years, so the Piltdown remains are in that collection. We celebrated in 2003 the, the 50th anniversary of the exposure of Piltdown Man as a forgery. 
but there were many aspects that, that were still unresolved and puzzled us, so I always wanted to get back to this material using some of the newer te new techniques we had to throw at the material, to see it, to throw more light on how it was done and who might have done it. So to understand Piltdown Man, we need to look at the views that were around in 1910 on human evolution, and of course no ancient humans had been found in Africa at all in 1910. So the models were being built entirely on material from Europe and Asia, especially Europe, which already had a developing fossil record. So the views can be summarized. There was a view that really just put all these humans in, in a linear sequence. So this would be Homo erectus down here, Homo heidelbergensis in modern terms, the Neanderthal humans. So this was a unilinear view that the known fossils <coughs> represented uh, a sequence to leading to modern humans. And then there was another view that all of these were kind of offshoots of the main line, and there was some mysterious ancestor that could have been the ancient ancestor for the modern human line that ran in parallel to these more archaic humans with their deep brow ridges and longer lower skulls. So we move to the village of Piltdown, uh, not far from Haywards Heath in, uh, in Sussex. There we are. Uh, here's Brighton, so you're down you know, near the south coast. And um, this man, Charles Dawson, he was um, a solicitor, um, you know, well known and well liked, well loved, uh, well respected. Uh, the family firm is still there in Lewis, uh, you know, Dawson Solicitors. So he claimed uh, he had an interest in fossils and antiquities. He, he collected dinosaur fossils and sent them to the Natural History Museum. He was interested in Roman remains, you know, many, many medieval material. So he had a lot of interests uh, as an antiquarian and amateur collector. And he claimed that some workmen were digging gravels in the village of Piltdown. And he thought these gravels looked interesting and that they might have fossils in them. So he asked the workmen to keep anything. And he said that the workmen handed him what they said were bits of a coconut that they found. Here we are, some of these pieces. So this happened some time before 1910. We're not sure exactly when it was. Maybe 1908, maybe 1909, maybe 1910, if it really happened. This is what Dawson said afterwards that the work that had these pieces from this ground. So he contacted Arthur Smith Woodward, the uh, keeper of geology at the, what was it, the British Museum of Natural History, um, and he had already sent him dinosaur fossils and so on, so they knew each other quite well, and he said, um, I think I've got something very interesting that's come out of Piltdown that we should investigate. And he convinced Woodward that it was important, and they started to dig in these gravels in 1912. So here's uh, Charles Dawson, and there's uh, Sir Arthur Woodward at the museum. And they started excavating in, in the pit. Yeah, a bark of man. Um, so here we are, the so postcard, searching for the Piltdown man. So there they are, uh, Dawson and Woodward, working away in their, in their office clothing, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and because they, they have work and they have teams actually doing the work. But this is this is the actual gravels in which they were finding the remains. So in 1912 uh, they very soon found more pieces of the skull and they found uh, in the same levels a uh, remarkable jawbone. Um, and whereas the skull pieces were very thick but also quite indicating quite large brain, the um, the jawbone seemed to be something distinct. It had uh, very flat wear on its teeth, but in other respects it was extremely ape-like. The front of the jaw was very ape-like. No sign of a chin there, or even a vertical synthesis that you would find in, say, the advertisements. Uh, so this was a strange combination, um, but uh, Woodward, uh, he wasn't a trained paleoanthropologist, he actually worked on fossil fishes, that's his specialization. <coughs> he, knew, you know, he, knew, he knew his anatomy. So he started to put these pieces together into a composite and he came up with this reconstruction. Um, now, I mentioned the Heidegger jaw, that had been found in Germany in 1907. And when Dawson wrote to Smith Woodward, he said, I think I've got something to rival, to, uh, rival, to rival Heidelberg in, in robusticity. Now here we've got Arthur Keith's reconstruction from the same remains. So he actually has made the lower jaw much more like the harder jaw. And he's got a small canine there, compared with the big canines of Woodward's reconstruction. So the canine hadn't yet been found, so this was an important difference between Woodward's reconstruction and Arthur Keith's reconstruction. 
And of course, in the pit, we're also uh, stone tools, dark colour, just like the rest of the gravels, uh, various fragments of tools <coughs> indicating an antiquity in modern terms of maybe a million years in terms of the fossils that are there in the pit. These all seem to be highly fossilised with the same dark staining as the Piltdown remains and the stone tools. And then, really almost to settle the dispute, the canine tooth was found at Piltdown in 1913. Uh, and it almost exactly matched uh, Woodward's reconstruction of the canine. It was perfect. So, Arthur Keith then, yeah, it was a great match, was human naturalist. He then said, well, okay, I can see that I was wrong about the loader on the canine. And so he remodeled the reconstruction. He gave it a bigger brain, because he disagreed with a uh, small brain, but he gave it a much wider like, like jaw. And here we have Arthur Keith's reconstruction of Piltdown Man. So there's this big brain, the crane was hooked, very modern looking really, thick, but otherwise modern. And we've got this much more ape like lower jaw with a canine about halfway in size between a human and an ape, uh, very primitive at the front, but with this flat human like wear on the teeth. So this thing was called Eoanthropus Dorsonite, the dawn man of Dawson. Here we are on the label. So Dawson got the thing named after him uh, by some and here we get the consensus. So here's some of the greatest experts sort of worshipping this Arthur Keith reconstruction. So there's an agreement. So here we've got uh, Sir Arthur Keith. There's Dawson looking on with a slight smile, of course, and proudly. Uh, there's Smith Woodward. Uh, there's Elliot Smith, one of the great experts on the evolution of the brain. Uh, Ray Lancaster, who was the former director of the Natural History Museum. Um, and here's Darwin with the seal of approval. <laughs> So it's all, all looking fine. Um, but it didn't carry on looking fine, of course. So, yeah, how did Piltdown fit in? Well, um, there were some people who said, well, with that eight by jaw, it, it must be a sign of of human evolution, an early offshoot that somehow independently grew a bigger brain. But people like Arthur Keith used it to support their idea that there was an ancient lineage of large brain, rather modern looking brain size. So he thought it could well be an ancestor. That's what we would agree with really, for modern humans. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and then, sort of, we get to the end of the story. That's the First World War's broken out. Things get a bit chaotic. Uh, in 1914, the last find made at the site is this extraordinary thing. Um, it's about this big, made out of a thick, what seems to be a mammal leg bone of a, some kind of elephant, presumably. Yeah, it's about that long. And it's pointed here flat there, and for all the world, it looks like the end of a cricket bat. And, and so it became known as the cricket bat. People said, how appropriate to have a cricket bat with the oldest English. Um, yeah, joking, but, it, but it's extraordinary. And that was found partly under a hedge, and part of it in the ground. So this weird thing was the last fight that the first built down site. But oddly, the next year, Smith Woodruff receives two postcards from Dawson saying, I've got some more Piltdown remains from another site about two miles away, and they ex almost exactly match the original finds. So I'm sure that here we are. This is, the, this is one of the postcards. Um, and there, he claimed to have found two skull pieces, which match the first ones quite closely. He found a molar, which seemed very similar to the one in the jawbones of Piltdown one. And he found, a set of friend working with him found part of the tooth of a rhinoceros that matched again the species of Pure Cow one. So these postcards arrived, but then Dawson <coughs> fell ill. He, he developed uh, 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 blood poisoning, as we called it, but he died of that about a year later. He became seriously ill. So Woodward was never able to find out exactly where these had been found. And he, you know, he looked at the map, patches of gravel. He knew where Dawson had been looking, and so he hypothesized they were found at a particular site about two miles away, but we aren't really sure. Okay, then time moves on, of course. And Smith Woodward retires from the museum, I think in 1921, he was peed off that he hadn't become director, so he took, he took retirement. Uh, and he um, actually moved down to Piltdown and dug there for you know, the last 15 years, his active life before, before he became blind. And he didn't find it because of single thing. Dawson had died in 1916. And then nothing else had just turned up from the site. Nothing like Piltdown Man turned up from the rest of the fossil record. Africa started to produce 
fish real fossils, such as the broken hill skull. Um, we've got the, the, yeah, the appearance of the Pekin Homo erectus fossils, the Solo fossils, and so on. All Neanderthals, nothing like Brooklyn that now turns up anywhere. And Franz Weidenreich, prophetically called Pildaman a chimera. He said this chimera should be erased from the list of fossil humans. He said, in fact, he said, I don't know why, since they put together an ape right jaw and a human skull, why they haven't thrown all the rest of the animals in the pit together to make a whole composite creature in the pit. So he, 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 he got it absolutely right. But, uh, there we are. So Piltdown Man became Christian Mars. He disappeared a lot of his evolutionary trees. Um, and then in 1949, Kenny Oakley, uh, Woodward's successor, well, he was head of the sub-department of anthropology, my predecessor was here. So Kenneth was uh, a geoarchaeologist in modern terms. He was interested in dating techniques, because radiocarbon wasn't around, but he developed relative dating techniques, looking at the levels of nitrogen and fluorine and uranium in bones to compare, let's say, a fossil skull with the animal fossils that have been found supposedly in the same level. And if they had very different chemical compositions, this might show that the material was being mixed up. So Swanscombe man, Swanscombe woman, in fact female, uh, we now know a 400,000 year old fossil from Kent. He applied those tests to the mammal remains from the Swanscombe gravel pit and the human remains, and they match very nicely in their chemical compositions. But when he did the same thing with Piltdown, the material seemed to be far younger. It had much less fossilization than the mammal bone. So that was very puzzling. Um, and in fact, his technician, Len Parsons, actually reported to him that when he drilled into the jawbone to sample it, it smelled like fresh bone. Um, so, uh, Oakley started talking to other people about these very puzzling results, and Joseph Viner, anthropologist at Wilfrid Legrand Clark at Oxford, they joined with Oakley to conduct much more thorough tests. So, up to now, no one had really sort of thoroughly examined the material for, for 30 or 40 years. They started to do it with a vengeance. And very quickly, they were able to show that the whole thing was fraudulent. They started with the jawbone and the solution that pulled that from. So this is the paper in 1953. Um, and they were able to show that uh, the canine tooth had been abraded significantly artificially. One of the molars had clear file marks on it where a metal file or something similar had been run across the surface of the tooth to give it a modern human kind of wear pattern. Uh, and they actually mocked up an orang jaw uh, and they showed how easy it would be to mock up the shape of the peeled down specimen by filing teeth and by breakage. Um, so they argued first of all that the mandible was clearly fake and then in 55 they said the whole thing's fake, that the fossil mammals have all been introduced from different parts of the world. Some of them had very high levels of radioactivity suggesting that they came from sites around the Mediterranean uh, and nowhere near Britain. So the stone tools also, if you dripped uh, a weak acid on the surface of the stone tool, uh, the dark stain disappeared. So some of them were recent flints that had been stained uh, with permanganate and iron oxide during the dark. So, extraordinary story. So there was a tremendous aftermath, so there were questions in the houses of Parliament about the confidence of the natural history museum. Uh, there was the local pub, uh, got really named Piltdown Man, and we had some lovely cartoons, so here's the dentist talking to Piltdown Man. I'm afraid the whole jaw has to come out. Uh, and uh, yes, more than Little Hampton. Uh, now tell me, Lady Little Hampton, just what makes you cling to your belief in the genuineness of Piltdown Man? It's rather uh, an ape like gentleman. Um, so yeah, it was, I mean, on the one hand it was a great laugh at the museum's expense, but it was hugely damaging to British science, of course, because some of the leading British anthropologists had backed Pill Down Man right through their careers. Arthur Keith was still alive when the news broke, but he was just heartbroken and devastated. He said, I mean, he spent a lot of his life you know, arguing for Pill Down Man. Woodward had died, but he, you know, his last book dictated when he was blind, his wife wrote him down. That was on the earliest English. He was still writing about Built Down Man near, near his death in the 1940s. So a lot of time was wasted. Smith would be a great paleontologist on fossil fish. If he'd have stuck to his fossil fish, he would have done tremendous work. Uh, and instead, unfortunately, we remember Built Down Man. So who done it? Well, lots of different ideas. Uh, 
So off they come in the door, it's been made. <laughs> so he lived near Pilk Down, he played golf at Pilk Down Golf Club. He had a car, uh, Dawson didn't, and he actually sometimes gave Dawson a lift to the side. Um, he published The Lost World in, in 1912, and some people have read into the book clues about Pilk Down Man. I think there's clues in there that he did. This is extraordinarily unlikely. Most people, of course, are concentrating on Charles Dawson, because Dawson was there Whenever stuff was found, he was all inside. Nothing was ever found when he wasn't there. And of course, these remains of Pilk Down too are only known from those postcards and the remains which he passed on to, uh, or his widow passed on after his death. So, and here we've got Harry Morris. So Harry Morris was uh, an amateur archaeologist. And Joe Viner, to his great credit, he went round Sussex after the exposure in 1955 for his book called Pilk Down Man. And he found that this guy, Harry Morris, had a fleet collection that supposedly included flints from Pilgrim. So he tried to track them down. He went around and around, and Morris's stuff had been in a farmhouse and then he could move somewhere else. And eventually, he found that if someone said, well, I think there's an old cabinet in a barn somewhere. And he went to this cabinet, and there were all these drawers from Morris's junk that he went through around. In the bottom drawer, he pulled out this flint with a note on it. And it said on there, stained by Charles Dawson with intent to deceive oh. <laughs> um, And here he says, I challenge the South Kent Museum authorities to test the implements um, of the same pattern as this stone, which the imposter Dawson says were excavated from the pit. They will be found to be white if hydrochloric acid be applied. The truth will out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, astonishing. So that didn't turn up until 1955. And of course, you know, this this extraordinary people at the time, you know, Dawson had died and Smith Woodrum and people puzzled over this and some of them actually said, This looks so much like a tooth from the jaw. Is it possible Dawson was very ill and he got confused about where he'd been found? So they even raised that question. So yeah. But also another name's come to try, Martin Hinton. So this chap was a volunteer in the department at the time of the Pilgrim Out Discoveries. Um, he was uh, already very knowledgeable about geology and fossils, he was collecting widely, he knew all the people, networked with them. Um, and after he, so he became keeper of zoology at the Natural History Museum. And in the 1970s, above his office in, in a loft, they found a trunk with his initials on it. And he worked on small mammals, he was a fanatic about small mammals, so it was full of dead mice from stuff that he collected. But at the bottom were these pieces of stained and cut bone. And, and stained teeth. And so obviously people thought, well, maybe could he, could he have been involved? And he, he was still alive when the thing was exposed, and he said he'd always known that there was something wrong with it. And they said, well, do you, do you know who did it? He said, well, I, I think I do, but I can't say. <laughs> because if it was him, um, So some people think that he did it, and he duped Dawson, or that he supplied the stuff for Dawson to find. We don't really know that, it's story. Um, so yeah, so we moved on to this year and we did some new work on the down material and unfortunately we couldn't do as much as we'd like to do. We wanted to do DNA analyses of all the material. But the work we did starting in 1910, in 2010, the work we did in 2010 starting then on DNA, we were unable to get any DNA from the skull bones. I mean, the stuff has been bleached and boiled as far as we can see. So it's destroyed a lot of the material, but we were able to get uh, DNA out of some of the uh, maple material. And we were able to subject the stuff to quite detailed analyses and we found quite extraordinary things that hadn't been seen before. So it looks like when the hoaxer was breaking this whole jaw, and it, you know, they, they broke it obviously, it actually cracked down there and they had to glue it together. It, so it, it, you know, they obviously snapped it and they actually cracked down here. Not only that, these teeth had been taken out of the jaw, and not only had they been filed right out of the jaw, they'd been pushed back in, but also the roots had been abraded as well. So they'd not only filed the top of the teeth, because human roots, tooth roots are shorter than main tooth roots. So the forger had actually taken the teeth out, and filed the bottom of the roots down, making them shorter, and then stuck them back in, we know that it had before. And, and we noted that extra filling, so on this molar, this molar tooth here, um, you can see this area here, uh, which was thought to be dented, it's actually some artificial filler 
Um, and, and again, it's covered in scratch marks. You can see. Now that's below the tooth surface. That's, that's obviously where someone's been scraping it to get it flat. Um, and there were patches of gravel poked into lots of holes. Patches of what seemed to be peeled down gravel to give it a spurious heaviness and authenticity. And the DNA showed clearly that the canine tooth and the remains in the jawbone, and here we are. So we've got a perfect match now. So we can show that the DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, is of a quite rare subspecies <coughs> of orangutan from one small area of uh, the island of Borneo. Um, and it almost certainly is the same individual that's been used. So that pilt down tooth, tooth is indeed from the same jawbone as the remains of built down one. So Dawson must have had the whole jawbone. Um, and then he broke off these parts and planted them in built down one. He kept back the other side and then he planted one of these motors, treated in the same way at this second site. Maybe he didn't bother to plant, he just said he found them at this mythical built down two site. So he's linked then clearly. There's a consistent method of production for all of the material, the skull bones, the, the, the jaw material. They've all got these plugs of enamel in them, of, of gravel in them. Uh, they've all got the same kind of stain. So we're pretty confident Dawson's awesome behind those two. Uh, and so you get a possible scenario that uh, Heidelberg man really triggers the thing. The fact that you know, here's a German find of a primitive human uh, Dawson's a believer in ancient humans. He's got eoliths, their remains which are coming from early humans, so they must be there somewhere. So he maybe hatches the idea to create what maybe he thinks will be found one day, or a real ancient human in Britain. So he starts to modify the material and plant it at the site. The excavations go on. Um, the the stuff is successfully published. He's ambitious. He's known to want to uh, senior, you know, uh, maybe a knighthood or something like that, uh, honours, uh, also to be a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, and of course, for an amateur to achieve those sorts of things, you've got to make really big discoveries. So you can see this as part of the plan to project himself scientifically as not an amateur, uh, but that he was in the, in the, the great discovery of fossils. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, this is, this is maybe desperation. So a scenario that I've <coughs> developed, not first person to suggest this, but that hint of material is curious, and Andy Carr and I wondered whether Hinton was a rather a very junior figure, but he clearly knew there was something wrong with Pure Man. He probably couldn't stand up to say to Smith Walter, you idiot, this is a forgery. So instead, could he have produced the most ridiculous <laughs> influence you would think of? He gets hold of an elephant. Carves it with a steel knife to the shape of a cricket bat, cycles down to pilt down one, one evening, dumps it at the site, and cycles away again. Now, if that's what happened, you can imagine what Dawson would have thought. Dawson, of course, has planted everything else. <laughs> <laughs> There's this thing that looks like a cricket bat. You can hardly say this is a fake, because people would go, well, maybe all the rest is a fake. <laughs> so it's then accepted as the oldest bone artifact in the world. The oldest cricket bat. <laughs> yeah, and the oldest cricket bat. Um, and then, of course, perhaps because of the pollution of the site, he then goes off somewhere and starts to develop another pill down site somewhere else, which is, which is what we want. So that's the possible scenario, but yeah, we don't really have the full story. Um, and I think that cricket back here, we want to do more work on where this came from and what it's made of and so on. And also, Adrian Lister is looking much more closely at the sources of all the fossil mammal material. So there's still a lot more to go on. Okay, a quick word of comment. Uh, how many of you went to Lee Burgers talk to uh, Yes, yeah, so, so some of you were not, I, I, I was away unfortunately, so you all know more than me, some of you. But obviously the basic story is that in 2015, a new human species was announced from the rising star cave in Johannesburg. And Lee Berger was the guy who kind of started the whole thing off, so he had the very sensible and I say rather obvious idea of asking cavers whether they ever found buttons down there deep in the caves. And this is a, a well-known cave system that people have been doing recreational caving for these 50 years. And um, some cavers said, well, yeah, this tiny little pit, uh, we found some bones on, on that floor of that pit. 
Um, and <coughs> to get there is very difficult. There's this Superman crawl, so probably because you'd have to adopt a flying Superman pose to get through a 25 centimeter high crawl. And then you've got the 20 centimeter wide um, traverse here to get through here. Um, and the caber, one of the cabers, in fact, was able to dislocate his own shoulders to get into that, like a snake, so that's how he got down there. Um, Berger was a bit too large to do that, so, uh, so he advertised and ended up with a team of uh, quite six quite small women who were able to get down there and excavate systematically in this chamber, uh, where they recovered uh, what well, is now uh, nearly 2,000 fossils from this chamber. Uh, deep in this cave. So this is 90 metres from the current entrance. It's very much in the dark zone um, and a huge collection of fossils have been recovered. So uh, here are some of them laid out. Um, age unknown, so we'll come back to that one in a minute. Uh, height of the adults about 1.5 metres, estimated body weight about 45 kilograms, a small brain, a human-like skull, teeth and hands, but ape-like shoulders. Um, skills. I'm talking about this one, climbing and walking long distances. Well, certainly the upper body looks like that of a climber. Although the hands are extremely human in proportion, the digits are very curved. Um, and uh, what makes it human? Well, that's an interesting one. Scientists believe that Homo naledi intentionally buried its dead in the difficult to reach isolated naledi cave chamber. Well, we'll come back to that. So here's the Here's the collection. You've got a fantastic collection of teeth. You've got uh, a large number of femora, uh, composite skeletons. There are at least 15 individuals here, um, ranging probably from newborn to, to quite elderly. Um, and in the ground, some of the material has been excavated in articulation. So hands and feet were fossilized. In fact, not even fossilized, really. They're in loose sediment. So this is one of the, this is one of the extraordinary things about this site. So the material that you usually excavate, let's say of Australopithecines in South African caves, you have to chisel it out of the rock or dissolve it out of the acid. It's rock hard with the limestone impregnation. This stuff, they were excavating it with plastic spoons and plastic articulates to avoid scratching the material. So it was in, most of it was in loose sediment, which is really shocking. Um, and there we go, there's a reconstruction of one of the skeletons. And in some ways, it is a very human body shape. Um, Rather than erect as well, they have quite long legs compared with, let's say, the Lucy scale. Um, the hands and feet, very human like, but as I say, with these very curved digits. But this part of the body is much more, you could say, ape like, suggesting that this creature was certainly still capable of climbing well in the trees. Um, and then, yes, this, uh, oh, yes, so there's this cranial remains, so small brain, so the brain size, two individuals, one's about 400 mils, hobbit size. Uh, chimpanzee size, one's about 500 mils, so gorilla size, really. Uh, but very small brain, so comparable really to some of the habitus material, uh, to the tiniest brain directus individuals to the hobby. So, um, yeah, uh, that's a that combination. And here we've got a 3D print because Lee Berger has very kindly put scans of a lot of the material online. So if you've got a 3D printer, and the resources to do it, you can free of charge download your own copies and print your own copies. So this is a jawbone uh, that we printed out of Homo naledi. So those are available. You can do the reconstructed skull to it is available to print out. How tall was the tall hobbit? How tall? Uh, about 1.5 meters. Yeah. And the one in South Africa was 1.5 meters. Uh, sorry, naledi is. Yeah. That yeah. Was, this is. Yeah. Uh -huh. There you are. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I'll go back. No, 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 sorry, sorry, let's go back. Yeah, there you are. About that's the largest, that's the South African. The Hobbit's about a metre tall. A metre, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so this is one of the most extraordinary ones. They claim that this material was intentionally disposed of down there by other members of this species. Um, you know, it's, it's right in the dark zone of the cave. Now, it's possible that hundreds of thousands of years ago, these accesses were slightly bigger. But, you know, this creature had to have artificial light to get down there that part of the cave. This is something to be a best riverside brain. There's no archaeology at the moment from the site, so we don't know this creature at all. And we don't know how old it is. Is it 2 million years old or 200,000 years old? Now, did anyone 
hear an answer from Lee Berger about the dating because allegedly there is something coming up. Yes, here. Coming what did he say? He just said it's coming out in the new year. Coming out in the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, but but he said to one of my colleagues that um, the date will be surprising uh, for human evolution and for archaeology. So who knows what that means? Um, but obviously this is similar to the whole situation. You know, we've got a small-bodied human. Um, you know, is it something that's pre-erectus, you know, that really branched off from the human mind before erectus? Is it close to the ancestor of erectus? In which case it must be, you know, lineage that goes back at least two million years. Or is it some weird, more recent derivative given the rather modern-looking, you know, body shape of the lower body and hands and feet looks very human-like. So uh, then you'd have to say the small brain is like a reversion. But what would, why would a creature be evolving that smaller brain, you can make sense of it on an island, but why is it going to do it in you know, the middle of South Africa? So it's really a puzzling find. So just to really uh, confuse you, this is my latest attempt to plot some of these things now. <laughs> um, so I've got the Hobbit here as a distinct lineage of Erectus running in parallel to the Javanese Erectus. Here's the Chinese Erectus. Here we've got Homo antecessor. Uh, we've got uh, the Denisovans, known genetically really, of course, material over here in Denisova Cave. Uh, Chinese archaics like Dali and Jin Shan, we don't know, some of them might be Denisova, but we don't have the DNA. We've got the Neanderthals in Europe and Asia. Uh, Heidelbergensis, now known to go on quite recent in time. And then of course the Sapiens lines of evolution in, in Africa. And of course as these arrows indicate, signs that these lineages, perhaps species, as I would call many of them, are interbreeding, at least to some extent with each other. Now, Naledi should be basal in its morphology, I think, to all of that, um, provided we don't sort of give excessive weight to the human hands and feet. So, um, but we could be in for some surprises, according to the vote. So, um, yeah, there we are. I think that's it. And just to say, though, finishing up, what we've seen there is just what big surprises there are to come, no doubt. Because, you know, as we've said, how many more Hobbit experiments are going to turn up in Southeast Asia? You know, we can find a completely new species down here in South Africa, and our fossil record comes from about 5% of the African continent. So 95% yes. of Africa has not produced fossil evidence, even though stone tools show that humans were there. So how many more surprises like that are yet to come? I think there'll be plenty more. And Asia, we've got the Denisovans turning up, a completely new kind of human from you know, these fragmentary fossils in the complete DNA sequences there. So India's only produced one ancient human fossil in the entire Indian So, you know, the picture we build, you know, look at that bias. You know, where are most of the scientists and most of the field work? <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's great, but it's a very biased picture uh, from a tiny part of the whole thing that it has well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Over to you and over to Chris. I have a bit of a ding dong, uh, and no, no holds barred. I imagine with as far as questions of discussion uh, concerned. Great. Yes. Uh, you were talking about controversies. What's your opinion on the new Naledi date? The new Naledi date. Yeah. Well, we don't well, know well, what just it in is. In general, does, do you think there's anything funny about it, or do you believe it's true? Well, what's what's odd is the, as I say, the mm -hmm. most material that's two million years old is in a South African site is, is really heavily concreted, you know, in, in calcareous matrix, this stuff isn't. So, I mean, it's possible the stuff's been redeposited from somewhere else, that's one possibility. Um, you know, a number of us think that the stuff wasn't intentionally placed there, that it's moved there from somewhere else. The fact it's articulated means that there must have been flesh on some of those bones when they were deposited, that's for sure. Yeah. Even if they've been redeposited, they've been kept together. So some of us think that there is, there must be an entrance much nearer to that chamber than has been announced so far. And rumour has it that they have discovered another entrance. Um, so that might be more information to come. Uh, also, allegedly, you know, I don't know whether he said it publicly, but they, they do have more material from a different site in the cave. Um, did, it, did, did he say that publicly? That, that he had more fossil material from a different location in the cave? Because he said that publicly at another talk. Yeah. 
Um, so, you know, if there's if there's more than one site with this material, that will help to really test the idea of intentional disposal. And you know, could there be artifacts in that other part of the cave? We do, we don't know. So, you know, I can only speculate until we know. I mean, he and John Hawkes have got a book coming out in March on. You know, it's called Almost Human, which is odd when they put it in the genus Homo. It is human as far as I can term, but Almost Human is the title. I'm sure they're saving some of this up as a nice, uh, you know, publicity thing for the for the launch of the book. So I think we'll we'll hear the dating when that book's coming out. I think the dating is going to be revealed. And as I say, he he said to one of my colleagues, well, it's going to be a big surprise for human evolution and for archaeology. So goodness knows, the archaeology must mean there's there is something to come. I guess on archaeology. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I can't. I really don't know any more you know, than that. Yeah. It's on the archaeology point, and I might have misunderstood you when yeah. you described the process. But I got the impression that the individuals who actually did the excavation mm. in South Africa yeah. were were small female cavers rather than trained archaeologists. I, am I wrong about that? I and is that important? Um, I think that some of them certainly had excavation experience because a lot of people applied. Yeah, so I imagine yeah. Yeah. he would have chosen colleges. people who had the skills yeah. necessary. I don't think it was a random pick. No. I mean, yes, of course, they had to be the right size to get down there, but I think they chose the people with the skills to excavate carefully, and it has been excavated carefully, <coughs> no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are, of course, some negatives, as you may know. There are some people who are uh, rather anti Lee Berger. So he's had some, there was a piece in the New Yorker which I thought was pretty vicious about him and his saying that he was basically a you know, publicity seeker and a showman and uh, you know, people like Don Johansson uh, waded in and said that it was, you know, he was a showman and everything. And, and is this that, is someone is who... Is a suggestion of fraud? Well, a suggestion that it was being overhyped, certainly. Um, but you know, for Don Johansson, I mean, this is a guy who, you know, uh, who made a huge, got a huge publicity blurb yeah. out of Lucy and wrote a book. And I remember there's a quote in there where he proudly says about how he ended up on television in a debate with Richard Leakey. And he actually says, I suddenly realised I was now a certified supernova of science. Oh. <laughs> so I don't know how he can, how he can point the finger at Lee Berger and say, you're a showman, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I think... Um, yeah, I mean, you've got to give Lee credit, and he's found the Sadiba material as well, of course, that's another lot of rich collection of material. I mean, there is some jealousy, undoubtedly, in it, yeah. uh, and obviously funding goes with success, mm -hmm. so um, there's those elements, and, uh, you know, Lee's had ups and downs in his career. He's had some very bad moments before these good moments, and we won't go into those, but, uh, you know, he, he thought he'd found another hobbit on an island in... Uh, in the Philippines, which uh, sadly um, did not turn out to be what he thought. So there have been some low spots, but you know, all credit to him for finding this incredible material. You know, it, it really could be revolutionary. Uh, whatever its age, it, it's got a huge <coughs> amount of anatomical information, and it's still only partly studied. There's a huge amount still to come. You did say you might have something to say about the idea that there was deliberate disposal of the dead down there. Well, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, the location, if, if that's really the entrance, you know, this is really difficult to get down to, and it's completely dark. So, you know, you've got to, if it's, if it's this species disposing of its dead, this is a creature with a gorilla-sized brain. It's, it seems, you know, you've got to have artificial, you've got to have fire, you've got to have torches, reliable light to get all the way down there, surely. I mean, and, and to do it repeatedly, because obviously they're arguing there are actually several, the, and there's more than one sedimentary layer with the bones in it. So this is behavior, if it was intentional disposal, it's got to go off repeatedly for a period of time. And I just think that seems unlikely for this. I mean, you know, we shouldn't underestimate. Who's, you know, making, give, that, give who's the making that suggestion? Well, this is in the paper, this, the paper that accompanied the Naledi you know, that was their hypothesis. So there's big discussion about the taphonomy. People have then critiqued it, um, and they've come back with more evidence, and they've just said it is the most plausible. Because, you know, it's not a carnivore den, apparently. There's no sign of chewing on the bones. There's no sign, there's no other animals. The, the, the only fauna down there, there's some, a couple of little, I think, rodent teeth or bat remains, tiny bits. There's no major other animals down there. 
Uh, there's no stone tools down there, there's no evidence of fire down there. There's just this huge accumulation, you know, nearly 2,000 fossils. So it's a very weird situation. Um, and the fact you've got the stuff in articulation, at least some of it. So, but I just, you know, it, I think it's a bit, I know, I know with The Hobbit now, yes, that's tool making with a chimpanzee's eye brain. So, you know, we, we have to keep an open mind, but the fact that allegedly there is another entrance nearer now, that may give us another perspective on how that stuff got there. You have another question? I'm um, not sure about the geology of the area. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's limestone, obviously. These caves are all in limestone, and so it's, you know, it's right in that area. It's very close to Stoke Fontaine and some of the other classic Australopithecine sites. So what about like movement? If you said maybe the gap is closed, but well, yes. Yeah, so obviously, you know, if you have, for example, growth of uh, travertines, they will obviously grow and narrow a chamber. So if you've got speleothems or if you've got rocks falling down, they will all tend to block an area and narrow it. Uh, of course, sometimes you can get water flow that will widen it equally. So all I'm saying is that how it looks now may not be how it looked half a million years ago or whenever that stuff got down there. So perhaps these crevices were you know, wider or perhaps there were other crevices that were open that are now blocked. So, you know, but I still, it's still a very long way. It's still going to be in complete darkness if that is in fact the entrance, which is maybe questionable. If they were found in sands, would that suggest there's water in there? Well, there are, there are fine sediments, certainly clays, and you know, s water deposition, redeposition is a possibility, I think. But you know, they've they've gone against that idea because of the excellent preservation, the fact you've got articulated material. Um, they've said that the material more or less decayed in the chamber. So, yeah. Yes. Question. Could I uh, move this, Chris, move this on just from this to another controversy? Yeah. I don't know if you were here in, in Britain um, in September, because uh, on Radio 4 there was a two-part documentary called The Wading Ape. Oh, yes. I, was on, I was on there, actually. I was on that program. <laughs> yes, briefly. They edited all of my critical comments out and just let me make <laughs> supporting comments. I was disappointed about that. Okay, of course. Good, I'd, I'd like to know what's your opinion of this and uh, how do you feel about it? And yeah. And why would someone like Sir David Attenborough be so persuaded? Well, yeah, I think he's persuaded because he's got a loyalty that goes back. So he knew, uh, obviously, he, he you know, knew Alistair Hardy. He knew Elaine Morgan very well, who, who uh, of course, you know, really built up a lot of these ideas on the aquatic ape theory. Um, so I think he had, you know, he'd been interested in it for a long time. He did a program maybe 10 years ago on it uh, as well. Uh, and. I did comment about it critically on a succeeding programme, so the BBC Science Unit, of course, has to fight for every minute it can get on air, yeah. So they were astonished that Sir David got 90 minutes <coughs> uh, on a, a, what, what we would call a fringe theory. Very credible scientists arguing in a very credible fashion. Well, I appear to be arguing in support of it, but that's because <laughs> they edited out 95% well, of my comments. Say, you know. Could you tell me briefly what your arguments are against them? Well, I made okay, <coughs> one of... I mean, the problem is now that the, the theory uh, now almost... It, it covers really the whole of human evolution. So it started off with Alistair Hardy as an idea that went back to the let's say the Pliocene, possibly even earlier. So it was an idea about the origins of human features and the fact that even walking upright could have evolved through you know, being spending a lot of time in the water, the first use of tools, uh, the loss of body hair, uh, body fat distributions, you know, fundamental parts of our biology going back millions of years evolved in an aquatic like, you know, a, a, you know, an environment that actually had significant time even deep diving in the water. So that was the idea, and Alistair Hardy proposed that the reason why we started doing it, because Africa started to develop, um, you know, saber-toothed cats evolved, there were dangerous predators on the land, so we started to go in the water. Well, one of the things I said on this radio program was, going in the water in Africa is not a good place to be <laughs> for something the size of a, of a chimp or, or a, a, a small human. You know, crocodiles are still the biggest predators globally on humans. Um, that was all edited out. 
Mm. So I tried to say that, you know, you, you know, they wouldn't last five minutes in most lakes and rivers in Africa because the crocodiles in the in the Pliocene were much bigger than the ones today. Yeah, we've got fossil ones and the ones today are nothing compared with what there was around. All through Africa. Yeah, that's right, land and sea, but I, and, and water. But I'm just saying that you know it's not a safe environment. So that so I, that was all edged out in my comments. And the problem is that, of course, it was called the lakeside ape in the end. So there are two. So there's an idea that you've got this ancient development of these features, and then you've got another group that have come out of it saying, well, actually, it's it's living alongside the water and feeding there, and that's something in the last few hundred thousand years. Now that's a very different story. This Attenborough thing conflated the whole lot uh, in, in one theory, and in fact you've got two really very different ideas in there. Um, I if I could say something, yeah. I, mean, I, I covered this in my book, Declarations all those years ago, yeah. I'm yeah. sure you know, uh, yeah. uh, of reading that book. Mm. And it just seems to me that a lot of the argument is just really not necessary. I mean, the fact, surely the fact is that throughout a large part of hominid evolution, our ancestors and, you know, have, have would have done better by being able to manage both climbing trees, perhaps even sleeping in them, and walking, running you know, on open savannah. Yeah. And whenever you come across a river or something, not not drowning. Yeah. So, or you know, it's, and 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 I just don't understand quite what the argument is. I mean, why mm. why 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 would you want to force people that think that that particular Darwinian selection pressure, namely not drowning when you get to some water? Mm. We'd, we'd have to, you know, choose between the initial impetus towards bipedalism, yeah. and on the other hand, yeah. for example, coming out of Africa and going around the shores and arriving at yeah. Australia. I mean, drowning is a pretty catastrophic thing, mm. and the argument about crocodiles is, you know, you might as well say we couldn't possibly be in the savanna because, because there's huge saber-toothed cats. We couldn't have been in the trees because the leopards can climb trees. I mean, yeah. that, I don't really see that as an argument. Mm. I mean, our answers wouldn't have been completely stupid. They could see where the crocodiles are, maybe. <laughs> maybe you know, scare them away some sticks or something yeah. across somewhere else with a croc. I mean, yeah. whatever, no, you, I do, just whatever counter- you do with other predators, yeah. you might have do with, yeah. with crocodiles. Sure. I mean, we did evolve yeah. and we didn't drown. Yeah. Um, so I can't quite see what the ferocity of the argument is against mm. the idea that a part of the selection pressures was being able to wade or, and not drown when you come across the water. I just yeah. don't yeah. quite well, see no, what I, it. If you listen to the science program, which is, sorry, you know, I got half of you saying that, so the science group was so peed off of course that they then had a, an answering <laughs> program with me and Rob Foley yeah. so you I don't know if you can still get that on iPlayer but there is a, I see. Yeah. there is an inside science uh, which was broadcast the following Thursday which had I me see. and Rob Foley and me saying some of the things that had been edited out of yeah. my well, original interviews and what I said was that humans are opportunistic and of course they would have fed by the water, yeah. if they need, when only Neanderthals were exploiting marine resources in Gibraltar. So, you know, I was saying there's nothing wrong with, with living beside the water. What I felt was wrong was arguing that we evolved all our fundamental human features in deep water, and which, although it's been denied, you know, that's clearly what Elaine Morgan is saying a lot of the time. Well, Elaine well, Morgan did sort of suggest that, but I mean, just the, just the fact that she might have got it wrong because he went way over the top with it all doesn't, yeah. doesn't necessarily oh, yeah, I mean, we then go to the yeah. other extreme and, and talk about yeah. savannah apes and so forth. Yeah. I mean, well, you'll the find savannah, me Philip Tobias made the point that there's, yeah. your whole savannah theory is equally dead you know, because, yeah, it's, because mixed water side is not the same thing as savannah. Yeah, and this is the point. It confl- because when, and this was the problem with the Attenborough program in a sense that it set up this straw man yeah. which was the savannah ape hypothesis yeah. Yeah. which was around 50 years ago yeah. So Alistair Hardy was right to say there was things wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, but of course now we know that these features are spread out over millions of years. Yeah. Small canines evolved very early, bipedalism evolves pretty early, the larger brain comes much later. Yeah. Um, so they're actually spread out over millions of years and you end up, you know, if all of that's due to an aquatic phase, we are so committed to the water, surely, um, why do we ever leave it? If it's such a great environment, why do we ever come back? You would agree that the, the theory that it's yeah. all due to an aquatic phase is complete and utter bonkers nonsense, absolute total nonsense. Not according to some of the tweets I received okay. after <laughs> my appearance <laughs> on the, on the inside side of any it. subject. Yeah, there, there are some fanatics out there. Why can't a sensible theory somewhere between to say that throughout the whole period of evolution, yeah. one of the selection pressures was water? I yeah. don't well, I'm on record as saying that wading in the water is one of the best explanations yeah. we have that, for the origins of bipedalism. Right, yeah, I've that's said that, and I, um, it still is true. But there's also Curtis Marion, there's also the shorelines, there's also the shellfish. The trouble is, Chris, that you're conflating you're, you're ramming together exactly what Chris said. You're ramming together 150,000 years ago, modern humans, and six million. No, you're awesome. Uh, I'm not afraid of anything.
I, I actually had a, I was on a radio program with Elaine debating at the time I was Leslie's PhD student and nobody else, nobody respectable would go on the program yeah, with Elaine but yeah, I, d yeah. I put my hand up yeah. and said and I just said exactly this if you could narrow the thing down to looking at modelling a pelvis would it create this change in the pelvis to the bipedal yeah. pelvis yeah. from the wading mm -hmm. then that would be yeah. Um, that would and, yeah. and leave the fat and leave the hairless yeah. because that's later mm. and all this mm. stuff. But, yeah. So yeah, so I'm not you know, throwing it out completely. I think it has value and water could be an important environment for humans and clearly at times, you know, early humans did uh, use those resources and would have adapted to use those resources. But anyway, I think we've said enough. Okay, I think but I listen to the, <laughs> the inside science program is still there. Right. It's worth you listening to the Atomer Runs and that one as well. So on a completely different subject, has anyone else got another question? Uh, <laughs> Abby, Abby, Abby sure. first, come on a second. It, yeah, I, I was just going to, that Africa map, you know where you have all the dots, pretty much down the um, eastern side of Africa. Yeah, let's go uh, see if we're going the right way. Yeah, let me just get... Yeah, that one yeah this is it. Well, that's, of course, you've got, it, it, this is the problem. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think um, you were there is um, also missing on there. Yeah, because uh, this is, of course, the more ancient humans, ah, okay. and Iwerleru, of course, is, is here, and I... Yeah, it's yeah, it's west, yeah, yeah. So this actually was mostly about the fossil that are in the exhibition, and Iwerleru, unfortunately, is not in the exhibition. Uh, I hope mm. it, maybe it will be in, the, in our... Once we have the money to do a big exhibition, I, I hope it will be in there. So, yeah, this is making the point that, you know, here's the Rift Valley science, so you've got, the, you know, the rifting has opened up these sedimentary basins, fantastic places to preserve fossils. Yeah. And you've got the volcanic horizons that help preserve and yeah. date them. You've got the limestone caves down here, the traps where fossils fall in, natural yeah. traps. You've got the caves up here. Yeah. And then you've just got this massive space I, I where there must be humans, because the stone tools are there. Absolutely, and yeah. I, this is what, what yeah. my question is going to be. Are there any... Is there, any, is there anyone actually excavating around that area at the moment? Because there has to be, because this is where well, culture uh, comes from as well. In the last culture few months. Culture isn't just the East yeah, Coast, yeah. culture is the West Coast yeah. as well. So, so there has to be. Well, but, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying, the last few months I had an invitation to actually start new work at you over there. Ah. And so I'm, I'm getting on a bit to start that, but I have put other people onto it. So there may well be a resumption of field work. I oh, hope, in the next I few years. This is a site in Nigeria called Iwo Aleru, and it's a site, so um, Thurston Short and his team dug there in the late 60s, and they found uh, a human skeleton rather badly preserved, but the skull uh, was there. Don Brothwell published it in Man, I think, General Broil Anthropology Institute, in around 1970, and he said it was unusually shaped. It's dated by radiocarbon to about 13,000 years now, late Stone Age. It's the oldest Modern, modern human, in oldest human fossil in in that whole region. There's nothing older. Um, and I then I studied it for my PhD and found it had unusual features, um, some primitive features even, even though it was so young. So I went back and revisited it, and we published <coughs> a paper in 2011 in uh, PLOS, uh, Public Library of Science. That's open access. So you'll see that paper. Katerina Havarti is the first author. So basically, we restudied the specimen. We checked the dating with new dating methods. We confirmed it is about 13,000 years old, and it has a mixture of Homo sapiens features and more archaic features. Mm -hmm. If you didn't know how old it was, you would guess it was over 100,000, maybe 150,000 years old, based on other African fossils. And yet there it is in West Africa at you know, 13,000 years with the late Stone Age. So it just shows us what we're missing in this story. Mm -hmm. you know. Because there, there is that, not, not just the word right around West Africa yeah. because that is where culture comes from yeah. and you add, well according to well. me anyway well, I just no, no, wish. No, 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 well, no, no, you no, see, no, no, if we had no, sites no, like no, Blombos, no. you know, if we had the preservation, who yeah. knows? There might be Blombos cave sites. And, and also, that yeah, that that we is don't know. Uh, forest, yeah. which is is not very good at yeah. preserving. Yeah. Yeah. And well, this that's is it. You can't. Yeah. You know, whereas here, yes. you can even. You know, yeah. Burger's done it. He's gone onto Google Earth, and he's actually spotted valleys with cave openings. You can't do that with Google Earth there because it's a huge vegetation cover. And but of course, you haven't places. got the limestone. You haven't got you, lakes and rivers will be the places. Okay, can we there. have another question yeah. in a minute? Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. So I think sorry. the place to look in these regions will okay. Iwo Aleru will 
repay yeah. some more work, I'm sure. But there are fantastic lakes and river deposits, and that's where I think people will will find the stuff. Come in on. Yeah. Okay, so, so well, connecting maybe to yeah. Larry. Now, what's your opinion about what is called Heidelbergensis? Can we have maybe bring up your yeah, picture yeah. So, of this because uh, it's obviously developing again. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, so obviously I've proposed for a long time that Hamadibergensis is a widespread species, that it was around 500,000 years ago, it was in Europe, it was in Africa, it was in Asia, and it gave rise to modern humans in Africa and the Neanderthal lineage in, uh, in Western Eurasia, and potentially, I argued, it could even have given rise to the Denisov lineage over in China. However, my version of Heidelbergensis is kind of under threat now, uh, and uh, you know, so, and uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's science. Science moves on. So basically, um, what's happened is that, uh, you yeah, know, we've had this thing called down here at about eight hundred and fifty thousand years old, and the Spanish workers who published that said it had a, a modern-looking face. So basically, you know, this kind of facial form, uh, nicely angled cheekbones. Uh, there, hollow cheeks, that's a modern human face. They said, we've got a homo antecessor child, 850,000 years old, that has a modern human face. And they proposed that homo antecessor was actually the ancient ancestor of modern humans and of Neanderthals. Um, so that would push, the, obviously, the, the common ancestry back a long way. Now, I argued um, for the last 10 years that that's one fragmentary child. We don't know the variation in the population. If we had a you know, an adult individual, if we had a much bigger individual, would it have a, a much less modern looking face? Um, so I doubted it. Well, several things have happened. One is that they've now found three more facial fossils of Homo antecessor, including adult specimens, and they all show a modern looking face. Mm. So, Sorry, it, where were these found? In Grandolina, in Atapuerca. So, um, so that raises issues. Not only that, They've now obviously looked at the single crisis material in great detail. Morphologically, it's really quite far down the Neanderthal line. The teeth are very Neanderthal. Maria Martino Torres mm -hmm. here in UCL has done a lot of work that shows that that material is already quite, quite Neanderthal. Um, not only that, they've got DNA from those single fossils. And they also show that this is already well down the Neanderthal line. Now, for my model of Heidelberg against this being the ancestor here, that should only really be the beginning of the Neanderthal line. And yet, it seems to suggest that the line goes deeper. And the calibrations now suggest the common ancestor lived maybe 650,000 years ago. So that maybe takes the ancestry back beyond Heidelbergensis towards Antecessor and raises the possibility that, after all, the modern human face is actually primitive and goes back to 850,000 years. And then Heidelbergensis and the Neanderthals have moved away from it. And we can certainly say that the Neanderthals have moved away from the ancestral position. Maybe Heidelbergensis did as well. So I am having to rethink that one. And we're doing some new work on this ourselves. Now I'm working with some of the Atapuerca people, making comparisons of fossils to look into this more. Yeah? This might be the point of You see how you've got your uh, unknown introgressor? Yeah. What do we know about it? Well, <laughs> and yeah. well, this brings us back to Ewo Ayers, possibly. Yeah, so, um, so we've got actual ancient genomes, of course, for the Neanderthals, for the Denisovans. Uh, we've got you know, some from uh, Europe and Asia of modern humans in the last 40,000. Unfortunately, we don't have, of course, ancient DNA for this early, because of the climatic conditions and the preservation conditions, we don't have ancient DNA, sadly, at the moment, from any, any of these older African fossils. But when you look at modern humans, you can also see if there's anything unusual in the DNA that indicates introgression. So, of course, that already picked up the fact that Australasians have uh, some evidence of Denisovan DNA. Well, Mike Cameron and his team looked at uh, some West African populations, and they find in, in some of them, well, first of all, there's a, there's a, a Y chromosome lineage that turned up in actual ancestry testing, in genetic testing, that's twice as old as any other yet found. So. As you know, you heard of mitochondrial Eve, this idea that you know, all, all female lineages today trace back to a female that lived maybe 150,000 years ago for mitochondria. When you look at Y chromosome DNA for males, they trace back to Africa again, about 150,000 years on the best estimates. However, 
a single individual turned up in a genetic testing, mm. African American, but tracing back to West Africa, that had a Y chromosome that is twice as old mm. as any wow. other yet found. Mm. So that suggests there's something unusual there in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And Mike <laughs> Hammer <laughs> argues that there's introgression in, in some Central and West African populations that goes back to an ancestor that's older than the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's the unknown introgressor there. And of course, Iwo Aleru might indeed be evidence of some mm -hmm. interbreeding. That that specimen's got some unusual features. Could that actually be physical evidence of, of some introgression? So yeah, we need to have a lot more data. It, it will be wonderful to have some real ancient DNA from the area. Um, and we've got to hope that somewhere there will be some freak of preservation that will allow, just as there was deep in the SEMA, that that material was deep in a cool cage for 400,000 years, and that preserved the DNA. You know, could there be maybe the Naledi material deep in a cave will produce DNA? I mean, so somewhere in Africa, maybe we'll get lucky. Or a high altitude cave, somewhere really high up, would also be maybe give us better chances of preservation. But we don't have that many of those high altitudes in... in yes, Ethiopia, the Ethiopia's got yeah, some high altitude yeah, caves. But yeah. yes, over in the west, west it's not going to be so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. But uh, maybe some deep, some, you know, just like a Naledi situation. Yes. Maybe there is something more like that to be found. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm just thinking that uh, when we leave, when we finish a little bit earlier, we give Chris a bit of a break and we usually get more people going to the pub. But um, I don't know if there's anyone else who wants to ask another question before we do go. Yes, yeah. yes, go on. Yeah, I mean, a friend of mine told me that Jewish people have the Neanderthal genes. Ginger. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. So, the, the about. Uh, well, it's probably going back several years now. So, probably four or five years ago, um, they discovered that Neanderthals, at least ones in Spain, El, C El Cidron that Neanderthal site, when they looked at the ancient DNA, um, that one Neanderthal there had mutations in the melanocortin gene that would produce red hair. So they actually tested it, they spliced it into I don't know, mice or guinea pigs and they grew patches of red hair. So um, the press had a field day with that, so uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise, I think it was the Daily Mail said, uh, you know, top, chen, top ten ginger celebrities who are Neanderthals, <laughs> Mick Hucknall, Ginger Spice, there were pictures of them all. Um, but of course the interesting thing is the melanocortin mutations are different in that Neanderthal than in modern humans. So in modern humans it looks like um, blue eyes, blonde hair, red hair are all products, as far as we know, of the last 20,000 years maximum. So they really are very recent arrivals. Light skin, like we have in Europe today, is also a product of certainly the, the last 15,000 years, maybe maybe younger. So surprisingly recent arrival for those. So the Neanderthals had evolved pigment variation long before we did. They were in those lighter, you know, less sun, a need for UV in the skin. They must have evolved variation in their body pigmentation long before we did, and they did it independently of us. And as far as I know, there is a suggestion, I mean, we've obviously got Neanderthal DNA that comes into the skin. Our keratin uh, in, in Europeans and, and Asian people seems to owe something to Neanderthals. So something in the skin and hair is related to Neanderthals, but that melanocortin mutation seems to be distinct for them, for red hair. All right. Yeah. Well, Chris, you've thrilled us, as you always do. So thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Thank you.